Good evening, everybody. My name is Monica Pamer. I'm the physician assistant here at Chester County Hospital in Electrophysiology. Um, I'm so happy to welcome everybody to our first um, Zoom presentation here for the Arrhythmia Center. Um, I'm gonna ask that you bear with us. This is, this is our first Zoom presentation, but um, it's gonna be a great presentation. We're gonna be talking about atrial fibrillation, the mechanisms and treatments. And we will be joined by Dr. Kurt Schillinger, the director of the atrial fibrillation ablation, ablation program here at Chester County Hospital. All right, without further ado, here is Dr. Schillinger. All right. All right, so we'll get started. Today's uh, presentation is basically just focus on uh, atrial fibrillation. A lot of people get their first diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. They really want to know what that means. Uh, why it happens, that's often a common question. And importantly today, what we're going to focus on is the treatment options that are available uh, for atrial fibrillation. So we're going to start with uh, our first slide here. Actually, just we're going to breeze through the first couple of slides. It just talks a little bit about my background. So uh, I trained uh, in my MD and PhD at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and then came up here for general cardiology in 2008 uh, and trained at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania for general cardiology as well as uh, cardiac electrophysiology. So then I came out to the Chester County Hospital in 2015 as an attending physician, and we started the complex ablation program at that time as well. I really have no financial disclosures. That's an important thing, I swear. So. As I mentioned, the talk is really broken down into five different segments. The first one is what exactly is AFib? So a lot of people get a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. They'd like to know what exactly that means. The second thing is why did I get atrial fibrillation or who typically gets atrial fibrillation? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Some people are not very symptomatic in atrial fibrillation. And one of the questions that they often has, have is, why is atrial fibrillation detrimental to my cardiovascular health if I'm really not feeling that poorly in the arrhythmia? And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then importantly, what are the treatment options that are available for atrial fibrillation? And in 2020, the options are significantly greater than they were even in 2010, believe it or not. So we'll take some time and talk about the way that we like to approach the treatment of atrial fibrillation patients, because one size certainly does not fit all. And then the final thing that we'll talk a little bit about is what options patients who come to Chester County Hospital have for treatment of their atrial fibrillation. So simply put, when we talk about atrial fibrillation, we're really talking about an electrical storm that's occurring in the top chambers of the human heart. We say electrical storm, we mean lots and lots of waves of electricity moving through the top chambers of the heart in a very discordant, disorganized manner. We like to compare what happens under normal circumstances or sinus rhythm with what happens during atrial fibrillation. So starting on the left of this diagram, you can see that one wave of electricity under normal circumstances starts in the top right chamber of the heart. That wave of electricity then progresses across to the top left chamber of the heart. And what that wave of electricity really does is it makes the top chambers beat in sync. And then that wave of electricity moves down to the bottom chambers last. And you have the four chamber pump of a human working exactly the way nature intended. The top two chambers pumping first, the bottom two chambers pumping last. And it's really an efficient and effective way to move blood through our cardiovascular system. We take the time during our uh, complex ablations to make maps of the way that the electricity moves through the human heart. And this is actually data that we acquired from a patient that came for an atrial fibrillation ablation. And if you watch the red, which is actually a wavefront of electricity, you can see it move in a very cohesive way across the top left chamber. This is the top left chamber of the patient's heart. You can see it move in a very cohesive way across the top left chamber of the heart. So there's just one wave of electricity under normal sinus rhythm, and these are normal circumstances that moves across those top chambers. And it's a really nice organized way to make the heart pump the way that nature wants it to pump. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna contrast this with the exact same patient who was actually in atrial fibrillation. And instead of seeing just one nice cohesive wave of electricity, you'll actually see multiple discordant waves of electricity moving across the heart. Go ahead, next slide. So this is atrial fibrillation. We'll talk, I'm gonna show you that in just a second. In atrial fibrillation, as opposed to one wave of electricity moving across the top chambers, as you can see on the left-hand side, 
there's multiple waves of electricity moving in several different directions all at once. And the result of that is that the waves smash into each other and they make new waves or they extinguish themselves. And the bottom chambers, which are always listening to the top chambers to determine when they should pump, are very disorganized. And the bottom chambers pump in a very irregular and sometimes rapid fashion. So now let's take a look, just like we did before, the same exact patient, but now their top chambers are in atrial fibrillation. And can you see all those crazy waves of electricity moving in a very discordant pattern as opposed to the one nice wave of coherent electricity that we had before? These electrical waves are slowed down about 100 times just so we can follow them with the human eye. They're moving a lot faster than we can actually see in this animation. And as you can imagine, when you've got electricity moving across your top chambers that quickly, the top chambers don't really have time to pump. So for a lot of patients who are stuck in atrial fibrillation, the top chambers are static. They're not pumping blood. They're just kind of quivering or fibrillating, which is why we call it atrial fibrillation. When we look at our EKGs, this is how we can determine if a patient is in atrial fibrillation. On the top, where it says sinus rhythm, you can see a little bump on the EKG, which is coordinated contraction of the top chambers participating in cardiac cycle. By contrast, below, you can see kind of chaotic movement of electricity through the top chambers and no real coherent contraction of the top chambers. And that's when cardiologists do an EKG on a patient and say, yep, you've got atrial fibrillation. This is how they can tell. So if we've identified atrial fibrillation as an electrical storm in the top chambers of the heart, I think a very reasonable question is, well, what exactly causes that electrical storm in the top chamber? To the best of our knowledge, those electrical storms are caused by bombardment of the top chambers with electricity from parts of the heart that electricity is not supposed to come from. So the way nature intended the top chambers of the heart to work is one source of electricity in the top right chamber of the heart, a place called the sinus node, which is why we call normal rhythm, normal sinus rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, that gets replaced by tons and tons of electrical activity from outside places. Probably the biggest place that contributes to bombarding the top chambers of the heart with extra electrical activity is the pulmonary veins. So in this particular animation, what you can see in the top left chamber of the heart are the pulmonary veins labeled LPV and RPV. Those pulmonary veins are just responsible for bringing oxygenated blood back from the lungs. They're not supposed to participate in the electrical activity of the top chambers at all, but for reasons that we don't understand very well, over time, and in particular in patients that are over the age of 60, the pulmonary veins can actually acquire the ability to send high frequency energy down to the heart. When you send that high frequency energy down to the heart, you have the ability to confuse the electrical system of the heart and create the electrical storm that is atrial fibrillation. It's interesting to note that because a lot of times when patients look up atrial fibrillation treatment or atrial fibrillation ablation, you'll see that the phrase pulmonary vein isolation or pulmonary vein atrial fibrillation. The reason is very simple because we've identified the pulmonary veins as one of the biggest sources of atrial fibrillation in patients that, that have this disease. Now the pulmonary veins are not the only potential source of atrial fibrillation. Other arrhythmias can cause atrial fibrillation as long as they occur in the top chambers. And one of the big ones is atrial flutter. So sometimes people get diagnosed with AFib flutter. You may hear that thrown around, but they're actually two completely distinct arrhythmias. Whereas atrial fibrillation is very discordant and chaotic electrical activity in the top chambers, atrial flutter is actually an arrhythmia where electricity is going very, very, very quickly around either the tricuspid valve or the mitral valve, or in some cases like this picture, the inferior vena cava. That rapid electrical movement in a circle can actually also bombard the top chambers and confuse the electrical system and can cause an electrical storm. And so patients that have atrial flutter can sometimes have atrial fibrillation. And we find that about 25% of people who are diagnosed with atrial flutter at some point in their life may actually develop atrial fibrillation as well. And then finally, there's other arrhythmias, uh, things that have been with people since childhood, things like AVNRT or AV nodal reentry tachycardia, some patients are born with extra electrical circuits that can participate in reentrant arrhythmias, and those can whip the top chambers into atrial fibrillation. So the vast majority of atrial fibrillation comes from the pulmonary veins, but there can be other things that cause atrial fibrillation. And this is the source of the bombardment by high frequency electrical energy that causes the AFib electrical storm. I have to say that about 15 to 20% of the time, 
we don't actually diagnose the trigger for atrial fibrillation and our treatment modalities are designed to basically make sure that we're addressing as many things as possible that could potentially cause atrial fibrillation. But 15 to 20 percent of the time, we can't say with certainty that we know exactly what caused the patient's atrial fibrillation. We just come up with a treatment plan that's uh, effective in treating it. <laughs> One question that I think comes up often is, I've been told that I have atrial fibrillation, and does that mean that I had or that I'm having a heart attack? It's a very reasonable question because sometimes cardiovascular disease gets lumped together. But the answer is pretty much a resounding no. So atrial fibrillation is electrical dysfunction, and it's in the top chambers of the heart. That's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have a heart attack or coronary artery disease. And coronary artery disease is really a plumbing issue to break it down to its basis level. It's a blockage in one of the pipes that carries blood to the heart muscle in the bottom chambers. So AFib, electrical dysfunction in the top chambers, coronary artery disease or heart attacks or myocardial infarctions, blockages in the plumbing in the bottom chambers of the heart. So patients ask, who gets atrial fibrillation? And the answer is predominantly patients over the age of 60. It's very, very infrequent that we see patients less than 60 years old without some form of genetic arrhythmia syndrome that have atrial fibrillation. But if you look at this graph, one of the things that you can see is that as patients get over the age of 60, both men and women, there's a pretty significant increase in the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in the United States of America. Because we don't know exactly what causes atrial fibrillation from a genetic level, we think it's actually probably polygenetic, multiple genes, depending on the genes that you inherit, but also environmental exposures can play a role as well. We don't have a good handle on exactly who will or will not go on to develop atrial fibrillation, but we know it's very prevalent in the United States and actually in, in the, the Western Hemisphere. So why is atrial fibrillation bad? So we took all this time to talk about this electrical storm in the top chamber, but if it doesn't really have that, that many consequences, then it, it wouldn't be important for us to discuss. So what is it exactly about atrial fibrillation that causes the problems associated with the disease? In the middle, you can see the way the human heart is supposed to work. And this is what we call cardiac synchrony. The top two chambers pump and the bottom two chambers fill, and then the cycle is reversed. The bottom two chambers pump and the top two chambers fill. This is what keeps the cardiac output, which is the amount of blood your heart can move per unit time, in a good range. This is why humans feel good, because we can move blood to all the vital organs in a very efficient and effective manner using this four chamber pump. On the left-hand side where it says normal sinus rhythm, you can see we have coordinated contraction of all four chambers, efficient pumping of blood, and we have a good exercise tolerance. When you contrast that with what happens in atrial fibrillation, we lose atrial contraction. We said that the electricity is moving so fast across the top chambers that the top chambers don't even pump. So now you've taken a four chamber pump, the human heart, and you've knocked out the top two chambers. So you lose the coordination between the top chambers and the bottom chambers. Some of our initial slides, we also showed that the bottom chambers are doing their very best to keep up with the top chambers, but the bottom chambers can't go as fast as the top chambers in atrial fibrillation. So the bottom chambers end up pumping in a very irregular fashion, which reduces their time to fill and reduces their time to pump. Inevitably, what this results in is a decrease in the ability of the heart to pump blood per unit time. And even though patients say, well, I'm not really that symptomatic with my atrial fibrillation. If you talk to patients that have a lot of atrial fibrillation, a lot of times what they'll tell you is, well, yeah, I, I have noticed a change in my ability to walk as far as I used to be able to walk, or I get a little bit more tired now when I walk up hills, or I've noticed I'm more tired by the end of the day. And it just makes sense if you decrease the efficiency of cardiac pumping, the end organs that are perfused by the, car, by the heart are, are gonna suffer. As electrophysiologists and, and doctors, we also know that atrial fibrillation is sensed by the heart as a form of damage. So the electrical discordance that happens in those top chambers, the heart notes that something is wrong and it assumes that there's damage that's occurring in the top chambers of the heart. But like any other part of your body, the heart decides that it would like to fix the damage, but also like any other part of your body, the only way the heart has to fix damage is to put scar into the heart muscle. And if you cut yourself on your skin, you're gonna get a scar. 
The same thing happens here. When the heart starts to determine that the top chambers are not working the way that they're supposed to, it starts to put scar into the muscle. If you put enough scar into the muscle, you can actually start to dilate the top chambers of the heart and you reduce the ability of the heart muscle to pump the way that it was supposed to. On the left-hand side, you can see normal heart muscle. All the red is basically muscle cells. So these are histological sections. And on the right-hand side, you can see the red muscle cells, but now you see a lot of blue and purple interspersed with those muscle cells. That blue and purple is actually collagen from scar that was put between the muscle cells by the heart because the heart started to notice what it thought was damage, but what in reality was just the electrical storm of atrial fibrillation. That process continues for an extended period of time, and it's different for everybody, but we typically think if it happens over a period of a year to longer than a year, the top chambers of the heart, which are represented on the left-hand side in normal heart, actually start to dilate. So they start to get big, they start to get filled with scar. And what that can lead to is leakiness in the valves between the top chambers and the bottom chambers. As the valves between the top chambers and the bottom chambers get leaky, the bottom chambers start to dilate because they have to pump more blood per unit time to keep up with those leaky valves. And what you end up with is a dilated heart over time when it's been stuck in atrial fibrillation for an extended period of time. It's interesting that this process doesn't happen to everybody and that's an important distinction, but it happens to probably over 50% of people that are stuck in atrial fibrillation for an extended period of time without some form of remediation or good medications to prevent the process from happening. We have this saying in electrophysiology, AFib begets AFib. And what exactly does that mean? Well. It just means that a lot of patients who have episodes of atrial fibrillation that may be short, infrequent, self-limited, seem to note a progression to a stage at which they have a lot more atrial fibrillation that lasts longer and happens more frequently. And that's simply because of the changes that are occurring in the top chamber of the heart as your heart starts to assess that AFib as damage. The more damage you cause in the atrium and the more the top chambers get dilated, the easier it is for the heart to go into atrial fibrillation the easier it is for it to stay in atrial fibrillation for longer, and the easier it is for more damage to occur to the top chambers. It becomes a vicious cycle. So, <coughs> pardon me, we differentiate. <coughs> I don't have COVID, I swear. We differentiate between paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is self-limited AFib that lasts for less than seven days, and persistent atrial fibrillation, which lasts for longer than seven days, because that distinction is important to us. It makes us believe that the heart has started to put scar in the top chambers and damage may be occurring. But probably the most important reason that atrial fibrillation is important and potentially damaging is its propensity for causing strokes. There is a strong association between stroke and atrial fibrillation. And the reason for this, we think, is again, because the top chambers don't pump very much in atrial fibrillation. And if the top chambers are not pumping in atrial fibrillation, there can be little static pools of blood. The most common places for those static pools of blood to form is in the left atrial appendage, which is marked there on the left frame. If static pools of blood hang around inside uh, the cardiac tissue for an extended period of time, you can get what we're seeing on the right-hand side, which is a thrombus or clot that is formed in the left atrial appendage those clots can get dislodged, and when they do, they can cause heart attacks or strokes. And that's why there's such a strong association between atrial fibrillation and stroke. It's also why patients that have enough risk factors for stroke or are stuck in atrial fibrillation for extended or sustained periods of time have to be on blood thinners it's to prevent that process from occurring. How do we assess who can just be on aspirin for their atrial fibrillation? And who actually has to take a blood thinner? Well, the answer is we look at atrial fibrillation duration, frequency, and we also assess other risk factors for stroke, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, advanced age, female gender, and prior stroke or TIA, which is stroke-like symptoms that last for less than 24 hours. We also weigh in the potential of vascular disease and things like patients that have had prior heart attacks or peripheral arterial disease, and if you have a history of congestive heart failure. If you have two or more of the risk factors that are listed on the right-hand side of this slide, and you have a history of atrial fibrillation, regardless of the duration of atrial fibrillation, we will probably start that patient on a, on a blood thinner. 
We also know that it's important for us to try to keep patients out of atrial fibrillation because more atrial fibrillation is associated with a higher risk of stroke. On this particular graph, what you can see is that patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, as we talked about before, AFib that lasts for less than seven days, have a significantly different risk of stroke than patients who are always stuck in atrial fibrillation, that's permanent atrial fibrillation, or patients who have episodes of AFib that last for longer than seven days, persistent atrial fibrillation. So for good reason, we try very hard to keep patients out of atrial fibrillation. So how do we end up treating atrial fibrillation? Well, our first step is always to prevent the dangerous things that can occur because of atrial fibrillation. The most dangerous thing is a stroke. So every single patient that comes to us that has a history of atrial fibrillation is evaluated for the risk of stroke. We've already talked a little bit about independent risk factors for stroke that we take very seriously when we assess a patient's risk of stroke with AFib. But we also look at the duration, as I mentioned, and the frequency of AFib to try and determine whether or not the benefit of using a blood thinner in a patient outweighs the risks of putting somebody on a blood thinner. In general, two or more risk factors lifted, listed on the left in conjunction with AFib means a patient needs to be on a blood thinner. We have several different options these days, usually dictated by patient preference, uh, but also by cost of the medications. After we've gotten past the point where we make sure that patients are not in danger because their stroke risk has been assessed and they're put on adequate therapy to prevent them from having a stroke with their history of AFib, we talk a little bit more about rhythm control versus rate control. I can tell you that these days, as opposed to about 10 to 15 years ago, there is a strong, strong recommendation by the cardiology uh, community to at least pursue rhythm control in appropriate patients for all the reasons that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, the slides labeled, why is atrial fibrillation bad? We wanna prevent the dilation of the top chambers, the dilation of the bottom chambers. We wanna try to reduce the risk of stroke. And basically we wanna give patients a better quality of life by maintaining a good cardiac output. When we say rhythm control, we're really working to make sure the patient stays in normal sinus rhythm. And rhythm control is appropriate for healthy patients that are symptomatic with their atrial fibrillation. And it's very appropriate for patients that have other heart disease who may have suffered an insult to their heart muscle because atrial fibrillation in patients that have had prior insults to their heart muscle is very, very poorly tolerated, particularly over time. There are patients that we have to pursue a rate control strategy, and that means leaving the top chambers in atrial fibrillation, but making sure that the bottom chambers don't suffer negative consequences from being in next to the top chambers in atrial fibrillation. Sometimes that means putting patients on good medications to make sure their bottom chambers don't go too fast. Sometimes that means putting a pacemaker into a patient and burning away the connection between the top chambers and the bottom chambers to ensure that we return a normal contraction and relaxation cycle to the bottom chambers so that they don't suffer damage because of irregularity in their cardiac cycle. So rate control, when you hear that thrown around for patients, that just, as we mentioned, make sure that the heart does not go too fast in atrial fibrillation. We have to use it for certain patients that are not candidates for advanced therapies like antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Some patients have had multiple ablations for their atrial fibrillation. They've been tried on multiple medications and regardless of attempts at keeping them out of atrial fibrillation, they still have atrial fibrillation. And at that point, we have no choice but to pursue a rate control strategy. The common medications that you may see if you're on a rate control uh, regimen include metoprolol, the 10 wall, diltiazem and digoxin. Those are the medicines that we typically start with for this particular strategy. And the reason that we use those medications is they have very good success, but they also have a low side effect and toxicity profile, which is an important consideration when you put patients into this pathway. One thing that's not listed here that we talked a little bit about just a second ago is putting in a pacemaker and doing a special ablation called a His bundle ablation that returns control of the bottom chambers entirely to the pacemaker's computer, but also make sure that patients have a very normal contraction and relaxation cycle in their heart. We're not gonna to talk too much about that strategy today because that's kind of a special discussion between cardiac electrophysiologists and their patients. And there's a lot of different pros and cons to that. Um, but that's kind of our extreme atrial fibrillation treatment regimen um, that, that some patients get. In rhythm control, which as I said, is our predominant method of, of pursuing atrial fibrillation management, the goal is to maintain normal cardiac rhythm. 
and that is basically maintain contraction in both the top chambers and the bottom chambers. This thing that we start with almost all the time when patients have their first diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is returning the heart to normal rhythm. And the way that we do that is with something called a direct current cardioversion or just simply a cardioversion. And in a cardioversion, patients come to the hospital, we give medicine to make you go to sleep, and then while you're asleep, we pass electrical energy through the heart to stop all electrical activity in the heart with the hope that it'll restart in normal sinus rhythm, not in atrial fibrillation. The procedure itself takes about five to 10 minutes, uh, but the total time spent doing that procedure, getting all the paperwork and everything done is closer to an hour and a half. This is an example of how we do a cardioversion kind of in a cartoon format. So when you come to the hospital, you get pads put on, you get an IV, medicine is put into the IV, you fall asleep, and then we shock the heart, which means we put a lot of energy through the heart. That stops all the electrical activity, and you can see there's a transition on that tracing or that strip from atrial fibrillation on the left-hand side, followed by the shock, which is a delivery of energy, a small pause where the heart stops for a second, and then restarts with that little bump that we talked about before, which is the coordinated contraction in the top chamber. So the patient's heart is returned from atrial fibrillation to normal sinus rhythm. The important thing to know about cardioversion is it doesn't stop the trigger whatever caused atrial fibrillation in the first place. In our first few slides, we're talking about where does AFib come from? Where does that bombardment of electrical energy come from? We don't stop that with the cardioversion. We don't address that at all. All we do is return the heart to normal rhythm. We always start with this particular procedure because for some patients, atrial fibrillation is an incredibly infrequent phenomenon. And if we can put the heart back into normal sinus rhythm, patients may do great for five years and not need another cardioversion, may not have another episode of atrial fibrillation. So how aggressive we are about the management of atrial fibrillation has to be dictated by the individual characteristics of atrial fibrillation in a patient. And we always start with returning a patient to normal sinus rhythm and then observing what type of frequency and duration of atrial fibrillation they have. But what if a patient has a cardioversion and then reverts to atrial fibrillation after the cardioversion? Then our next step comes into play. And our next step is really to apply medications to the heart to attempt to suppress the triggers that may be causing atrial fibrillation. Common medications as a first round of therapy for this include metoprolol and diltiazem. So if you've ever been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you may be on one or both of these particular medications. And these medications are a shotgun approach to the aberrant electrical activity that can cause atrial fibrillation. Give these medicines to patients and they kind of suppress extra electrical activity in the heart. Importantly, they also suppress extra electrical activity in places like the gut and the brain. So when patients first start on metoprolol, it's not uncommon for patients to have a little bit of brain fog or things are moving a little slower upstairs. But if you push through that after two to three weeks, patients seem to do very well. And with diltiazem, it has a tendency to cause constipation because it can slow down motility in the gut. Um, that doesn't go away after a couple of weeks, so we usually have to put patients on a soluble fiber regimen just to get over the, the side effects of diltiazem. So what happens if patients are, have had a cardioversion, have reverted to atrial fibrillation, they've been started on a very good medication like metoprolol or diltiazem, but they continue to have more and more atrial fibrillation despite good medications in a first round of therapy? Well, then we talk about what we call advanced therapies. And advanced therapies are more targeted therapies that are designed to suppress the triggers as well as slow atrial fibrillation wavefronts as they move across the top chambers of the heart. These are medications that are stronger than metoprolol and diltiazem. As I'm sure you can guess, we never get away scot-free. There's no free lunch. So when we talk about stronger medications, we're also talking about the potential for stronger side effects. Some of the medications that we call antiarrhythmic medicines include flecainide, propafenone, sodalol, ticacin or dofetilide, and amiodarone. These medicines are much more effective it blocking the electrical activity that can be triggers for atrial fibrillation. But as I mentioned, they also come with a bevy of side effects. So we have to be very careful and selective about patients that we give certain medications to. In general, when we think about these particular medications, on the left-hand side, we have a certain class of medications, flecainide and propafenone. And the biggest side effect that can occur with these medications is fatigue. So for obvious reasons, we try not to give them to, to younger patients because they really, really are not well tolerated. 
But we also know that we can't give them the patients that have had prior stents put in their heart, or prior heart attacks, or have a history of coronary artery disease, because that can actually lead to sudden cardiac death. Sotalol and dofedilide, which are in the middle of the slide, are very effective medications that have been around for 20 years to treat atrial fibrillation, but not everybody can take these medications. People with chronic renal insufficiency or renal disease are not candidates for these medications. And one of the biggest side effects of these medicines is they can actually cause ventricular fibrillation, which is a cause of sudden cardiac death. So laws recently received FDA approval to be started as an outpatient, and it's, we start the medicine on a Monday morning, and then you have to come back to clinic on a Wednesday to get an EKG to make sure that you're one of the people that can tolerate the medicine. But some patients actually have to be started on Sodalol as an inpatient in the hospital, which means you stay in the hospital for two and a half days, and we do an EKG after every single dose of the medicine. There's five doses that you have to take over a period of two and a half days, so a dose every 12 hours. And we really try to make sure that your, your heart is not changing in a dangerous way in response to the medications. Dofedilide or Ticacin, which we joke is basically Sodalol's cousin, always has to be started in the hospital. That particular medicine cannot be started as an outpatient. And then finally, the most effective medicine, antiarrhythmic, to treat atrial fibrillation is amiodarone. And that's been around for over 30 years. Unfortunately, amio, over time, is toxic to the liver, lungs, skin, eyes, and thyroid. So while it's an incredibly effective medicine to stop atrial fibrillation, to prevent atrial fibrillation, to shorten episodes of atrial fibrillation, it has a really, really large toxicity profile. It's really not a good long-term option for patients for treatment of atrial fibrillation. All told, when we look at studies that talk about how effective these different medications are for the treatment of atrial fibrillation, and when we say treatment, we mean not only a reduction in the number of episodes of atrial fibrillation, but a reduction in the duration and the frequency of atrial fibrillation, about 20 to 40% of the time, these medications, if given to the appropriate patient, can reduce the number and duration of episodes of atrial fibrillation. What if you've tried one of these medications or you're not a candidate for these medications and, and you have more atrial fibrillation? Well, for that group of patients, there's something called cardiac ablation. Cardiac ablation was invented in the late 1990s after an identification of the fact that the pulmonary veins were the source of most atrial fibrillation. And the technology has grown by leaps and bounds since that time. But it was really designed because instead of using a blanket or shotgun approach to the treatment of atrial fibrillation with medications that have a bevy of side effects, we wanted a much more targeted therapy that could go up and attempt to address what's causing the atrial fibrillation in the first place, and by doing so, limit side effects, limit exposure to medications, but significantly increase eff efficacy for, for treatment. This is an example of the cardiac electrophysiology lab at Chester County Hospital. This is the old one. This is what we used to call lab three, where we did most of our work. With the brand new procedure platform, we have most of this equipment, but we have it in a room that's half again as big, and it's got beautiful lighting. And it's right next to where they do the tavers. I want to mention that as well. When we do an atrial fibrillation ablation, the goal of an AFib ablation, and if you look up online, you'll see pulmonary vein isolation. The goal of an AFib ablation is to isolate the pulmonary veins. As we discussed in early slides, the vast majority of atrial fibrillation actually comes from the pulmonary veins. So the hallmark of an AFib ablation is that we isolate the pulmonary veins. The way that we do that is by making burns individually, one at a time, show some video of how that's done, around the pulmonary veins to break the electrical connections without compromising the ability of the veins to deliver blood. We want them to work as plumbing. We just don't want them to send any electrical activity down to the heart. So we create a ring of burns around the pulmonary veins, which is demonstrated in this picture, that creates a line of electrical blocks so that the pulmonary veins can't send the, the heart into atrial fibrillation. We do this procedure under general anesthesia, and we use a separate and special set of catheters, including a GPS-like system called an electroanatomic mapping system, that we use to create a map of the human heart so we know where we're supposed to make our burns uh, to isolate the veins. At the same time, we have this unique opportunity to attempt to address other arrhythmias such as atrial flutter or reentric tachycardias to ablate them so that we can reduce the potential that they're causing atrial fibrillation as well. So with our mapping systems, we can identify other abnormal sources of atrial fibrillation and get rid of them at the same time.
A great question is, how do we know where to burn? Well, while the patient's under general anesthesia, as I mentioned, we actually put catheters up into the heart using the veins and the legs. And our catheters, which are shown there at the bottom left part of the screen, actually are like a paintbrush. So they're very floppy and they have little metal bipoles on them and magnets. That catheter is accessioned to a very strong magnet that's underneath the patient that creates a GPS-like field around the patient's heart. So the first part of our atrial fibrillation ablation procedures is the generation of what's called an electroanatomic map. And it's a combination of the electrical activity and the geometric structures that are present in the top left chamber of the heart. It's obtained in real time. And I move that catheter around all the different parts of the heart to create the geometric shell that is an individual patient's top left chamber or left atrium. What we're gonna look at here is a video where you can actually see that paintbrush shaped catheter being accessioned to the GPS like system that the patient's laying in front of or on top of. And as I move the catheter around, you can actually see the system generating a three dimensional shell correlating with the position of those splines or those little paintbrush bristles that are the different parts of the heart. Now here, what I'm doing is I'm actually painting the left pulmonary veins. So if we play it one more time, you can actually see the paintbrush catheter go from the top left, that's the left superior pulmonary vein, come down, fill out some geometric structure, and now it goes into the left inferior pulmonary vein. So we've already identified the location of two pulmonary veins. Obviously, we want to put everything into a cohesive environment so we know where other structures are located because that's what keeps people safe. So in the next slide, you'll actually see that we've filled out the back wall of the heart, and now we're looking for the right pulmonary veins. The catheter right now goes to the floor. We fill out a little bit of information on the floor, and you can see how, how very compliant those little bristles are so that we know we're not poking and prodding. Then we find the right superior pulmonary vein. So those are the, that's the, the pulmonary vein on the right top side of the left chamber. And we come down and we find the right inferior pulmonary vein. So now, and this process took about five minutes. After five minutes, we've created a geometric shell in three-dimensional space of the patient's heart. And you can see the two left pulmonary veins over here, left superior, left inferior. And then over on the other side of the model, you can see the right superior, and the right inferior pulmonary vein. So we've already located the, the pulmonary veins. And this image and this data is actually projected on a screen in front of me so that I can move it in three different dimensions so I can tell exactly where the catheters are located at all times. The final thing that we do is we put all that pulmonary vein information, that three-dimensional shell, in the context of other important structures in the heart. So this is just kind of icing that we put on the cake here. We want to make sure that we identify septal structures. You can see them moving the map for me so I can identify structures that are located next to the pulmonary veins, right? Because we don't want to burn anything that we should not be burning. So we take a lot of time to make very detailed maps so we know exactly where everything is located in 3D space. And again, the majority of our time is focused on the pulmonary veins and why is that? Well, for the reasons that we discussed, the pulmonary veins are the source of most atrial fibrillation in patients. And our goal, no matter what, is to get them electrically isolated. All right, after we've identified the location of the pulmonary veins, our next step is to make burns because we want to burn around the pulmonary veins. And the catheter that's in the middle of the screen is actually the ablation catheter. So there are two catheters in the top left chamber of the heart. But that catheter is not used to create a three-dimensional shell. So how do we know when the ablation catheter is in touch with the heart and then the correct location for the three-dimensional shell? Well, the answer is the tip of those ablation catheters has something called force sensing technology. So the catheter can tell when it's in contact with tissue because of a piezoelectric element that tells it it's in touch with tissue. It's projected at the same time inside that three-dimensional shell so I can tell where the contact is occurring relative to the three-dimensional shell. And we make a big deal out of this. So no matter what cardiac electrophysiologist you talk to, they make a big deal out of it because this is what keeps patients safe. We want to know where our catheters are located in three-dimensional space, and we want to know how hard they're pushing on certain cardiac tissues because that's, again, what keeps patients safe. So in this video, you will see that ablation catheter and a vector, which is the arrow on top of the catheter, 
move. As the catheter moves back towards the back wall of the heart, you'll see the vector change. And you'll see the number to the right change as well. So right there, there's about eight to 12 grams of force on that catheter pushing on the posterior wall. And as I move the catheter away from the wall, the force contact changes. We'll watch that one more time so you can see. So right now there's a zero, meaning it's not in contact with anything. As the catheter gets moved back towards the posterior wall of the top left chamber, it comes into contact. The vector changes to tell me what direction the force is directed. You can see the numbers next to it change to let me know there's good contact. And then we move away and the patient stays safe. We know how hard the catheter was touching and we know where it was touching based on the electroanatomic model. So that's just the beginning of the fun. So now we actually have to isolate the pulmonary veins. After we made this map, we identified the structures that are relevant to the patient's anatomy. We actually have to make a burn. And how do we do that? We do it one burn at a time. So we put the catheter in contact with the shell and, and with the patient's heart. The computer keeps track of where we're making our burns and each burn is about 15 seconds long. So in this video, what you'll see is the ablation technology comes on, the tip of the catheter turns red to let me know we're making a burn. And if you hold the catheter in a good position for long enough, the computer will say, that is an adequate burn that you made, Dr. Schillinger, great work. And I get a little pink ball or a little red ball to let me know that's where I made a good burn and now I need to move on to my next spot. We do that process about 50 to 100 times in an atrial fibrillation ablation. And that's what leads us to isolate the pulmonary veins. So one burn at a time around all, all the pulmonary veins on the right-hand side and all the pulmonary veins on the left-hand side. So for my patients that have gotten an atrial fibrillation ablation, when we're done, we often make what's called a map for you, an electroanatomic map. And our pictures really are designed just to show you what we did during the procedure. You, everyone saw how we made one burn, but we keep doing that process over and over and over again until we've got electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins. And then we share those maps with our patients so they can see exactly what we've done. And this is an example. Here you can see before on uh, the video, you saw one burn. This is after we've made probably about 120 burns to isolate this patient's pulmonary veins. And they go all the way around the pulmonary veins in a big ring, just like we showed in, in prior slides, to isolate the veins electrically. One of the things that we're really lucky to have at Chester County Hospital when it comes to the complex ablation program is up-to-date equipment. So because of one of our very generous donors, we obtained uh, the latest software to actually determine exactly the ways electricity moves in the human heart, but also to acquire geometric data at the same time. And what we've learned since 2015 is the ability to acquire tons and tons of data in a relatively short period of time improves the ability uh, for us to, to generate ablation strategies that really help our patients to correctly identify arrhythmias. So instead of just saying, oh, this patient has atrial fibrillation, with our mapping systems, we can now determine whether it's atrial fibrillation or another arrhythmia. And to minimize the amount of time that we're spending inside the human heart. And that's critically important because reducing complications occurs as a consequence of minimizing the time you spend putting catheters in the heart. This particular slide that we kind of show is the latest software for this mapping company. Uh, it's obviously, we did this in our new lab at uh, Chester County Hospital, but over a period of less than seven minutes, we acquired 6,000 data points in the right atrium of this patient. And the new mapping system and the new mapping software actually turns that data into not only geometric structures, so you're looking at the right atrium of the patient, but also vectors of electricity movement uh, in this patient. So it's just incredible technology. And the reason we point this out is we said that the mapping systems now are significantly better than the mapping systems in 2010. So some patients had ablations in 2010 or 2012 and they say, why am I, if I'm having more AFib, why am I going to have another ablation at this time? And the reason is because the, the systems are, are so much better, just leaps and bounds above the systems we had even five years ago. So We like to compare risks and benefits for the different treatment modalities, right? As we said before, one size doesn't fit all. So when we look at patients individually, in terms of how we'd like to treat their atrial fibrillation, we go in a very stepwise fashion based on the individual characteristics of the patient, and also based on what type of atrial fibrillation they're having, paroxysmal versus persistent, all that kind of stuff. Very broadly, atrial fibrillation ablation is probably twice as effective as any medication that we can give a patient. That just kind of makes sense. You're actually taking catheters and you're attempting to address 
the issue that's causing atrial fibrillation in the first place. So across the United States, even using prior generation ablation technology, AFib ablation works about 60 to 80% of the time to prevent atrial fibrillation or reduce the frequency or duration of episodes of atrial fibrillation. That 60 to 80% includes either one or two ablations. Some patients need a second ablation to have a good outcome in their AFib uh, from an ablation standpoint. By contrast, antiarrhythmic medicines, as we, looked, as we discussed over the same time period, have only about a 20 to 40% efficacy. But again, for some patients, that's the right approach. That's the thing that should be done. And when you compare the risks, AFib ablation is an incredibly safe procedure. You can look there. Uh, recent study called Cabana that looked at uh, complications that occur across the United States from atrial fibrillation ablation. Very, very infrequent complications. But when complications occur in atrial fibrillation, they can be very dangerous. So we take, obviously, the technology and the procedure very seriously. In antiarrhythmic medications, there's also risks. And we talked a little bit about some of those side effects and risks. And the biggest one being sudden cardiac death. But again, because we risk stratify patients prior to putting them on these medications, we don't have to worry as much about that type of complication. As we've already mentioned, one size does not fit all. And one of the big advantages of having access to a cardiac electrophysiologist is that we can walk through the process with patients step by step to make sure that we're maximizing the benefit patients are going to get from each step in the process by, and, and minimize the risk that we're going to expose patients to. So we have another question that always comes up. I shouldn't say it always comes up. I'm sorry. It very frequently comes up. And it's, my friend told me that since I have AFib, I should get a pacemaker. And do pacemakers help treat atrial fibrillation? And the answer to that question is that pacemakers by themselves cannot help to treat atrial fibrillation. We always use pacemakers in conjunction with one of two things, medicines to help treat atrial fibrillation or cardiac ablation to get rid of the connection between the top chambers and the bottom chambers that we talked a little bit about before we're not going to spend a lot of time on. So by themselves, pacemakers cannot treat atrial fibrillation. However, some patients take medicines for atrial fibrillation that are effective, but they slow their heart down too much. And so a pacemaker can help us because it can maintain a good stable cardiac rhythm that's not too slow, 60 beats per minute is where we typically set them. And then it gives us the opportunity to use good medicines to treat AFib because we know their heart's not gonna go too slow. So pacemaker are these little computers that we put into the human heart. And they usually have two wires, one wire that goes down into the bottom right chamber of the heart and one wire that goes in the top right chamber of the heart. And as it says here in this slide, in atrial fibrillation, your top chambers are going too fast, so pacemakers are not gonna help with that. They're designed to make sure your heart doesn't go too slow. By themselves, pacemakers can do nothing to prevent or to treat atrial fibrillation. What they do allow us to do, as I just mentioned, is use good medications to actually treat atrial fibrillation, and the pacemaker can prevent the heart from going too slow in response to those medications. So that's when we use pacemakers in atrial fibrillation management, but by themselves, they cannot treat AFib. All right, so um, at Chester County Hospital, we really have three cardiac electrophysiologists happy to help in the management of AFib at any, any time. Dr. Huey is, is my partner at uh, Cardiology Consultants of Philadelphia. He has expertise in antiarrhythmic medication and also in pacemakers. And then I am the director of the complex ablation program here at Chester County Hospital. So my specialty includes cardiac ablation, pacemakers, and antiarrhythmic medications. And Westchester Cardiology uh, has Dr. Amon Kaji, who also has expertise in cardiac ablation, pacemaker implantation, and antiarrhythmic medications. And then Monica, who you guys met at the beginning, who's actually the best kept secret at Chester County Hospital, but she helps to run our arrhythmia service, uh, also takes care of all of our patients pre and post ablation, and is responsible for making sure that patients get adequate follow-up before they leave the hospital and during pre-admission testing to make sure everything is all set if you're having an ablation or a pacemaker or something like that. State-of-the-art facility, Lab 3, which is actually not even state-of-the-art anymore. So the equipment that's listed in that, or the shown in that photo, excuse me, has actually all been moved over and upgraded to our brand new beautiful procedure platform, which you can see when you drive by the hospital. And we've been doing elective ablations for atrial fibrillation since the uh, second week of June here at the hospital. I know there's some concerns about elective procedures in the COVID era, 
but we've actually been doing a phenomenal job keeping patients safe um, since the second week of June here. Uh, no matter what, some patients want to have atrial fibrillation, ablation, some patients need pacemakers, whatever you do, our recommendation is please, please, please go to some place that does a lot of atrial fibrillation ablations or a lot of ablations, period, because that's really what's been demonstrated in multiple studies to minimize the risk to patients. So obviously, Chester County Hospital, we're very, very high ablation volume. We do anywhere from two to six ablations a week, and we'll do probably over 120 or 150 ablations this year alone. Um, also, you want to sit down and talk to your electrophysiologist about other options besides ablation. Obviously, we talked about in this slide. So there's a lot of options, and going through step by step with them is, is really a good way to make sure you're on the right track to treatment of your atrial fibrillation. 